Hey, Shalom, Israel. Brother Reggie Jr. here. So today, brothers and sisters, we're going to be doing Leviticus chapter 2 and Leviticus chapter 3. Just picking up where I left off from last time. However, before I start this lesson, I did want to make mention of something that I didn't get to make mention of in the previous lesson. And that's that, brothers and sisters, all of these offerings that we're looking at, they represent Jesus. All of them. Okay. And the offering that he would be for us because he will become the offering for us to the father on our behalf if that makes sense because um ultimately in a nutshell all of these offerings did two things okay atone and to make peace with the father that's in a nutshell what these offerings were about now with that being said with christ being this offering he was that offering one time and forever because see with these offerings that our ancestors did they had to do these offerings over and over again why because these offerings could never really truly atone these offerings really could never truly make peace between us and the father that's why these things had to be done over and over continually because these things could never atone for us our sins these things could never truly bring peace between us and the father and through us doing those things continually over and over and over again that should have provoked thought in our ancestors to say hey we have to always continually keep doing these things that means we need what we need a savior that can do these things for us one time and forever and that was the whole purpose of christ to atone for our sins and to make peace between us and the Father and especially atone for those sins because the blood of bulls and goats, they could never atone for our sins, ever. We needed something that could atone for our sins one time and forever and that was Christ. See, the only difference was with Christ, with him making this atonement and this peace for us, the only way that that was ratified is through our belief in Christ. Okay, that's the only way we can take hold of this new covenant or this, as we should say, this renewed covenant or this repaired covenant. This repaired covenant, we, we must believe in Christ. Because if we don't believe in Christ, guess what? We're still under that broken covenant that unrepaired covenant and that's going to lead to death because you have nothing to atone for your sins you have nothing to make peace between you and the father so you must take hold on christ and you must come under the blood of christ if you want your sins to be atoned for if you want peace between you and the father but you must believe in Christ. So a lot of you non-Messianics, a lot of y'all are in some serious danger. Because you're still under sin and you there's still no peace between you and the Father. All right? That's why it's so important that you believe on Christ. Christ, I, Lord, I believe that Jesus made this atonement for me. I believe that he made peace between me and you. And it's in your belief in Christ, that's what's going to make you righteous. Because uh, initially, righteousness would have came by the law, but we were proven to be sinful. We couldn't keep the law, okay? And the Lord knew that from the beginning. He already knew that we would need a Savior. He knew that we would need Jesus. We would need that blood to cover us. He already knew that. So this time, in order to attain the atonement peace and to obtain righteousness, you have to go through Christ. You must believe in Christ and the sacrifice that he made. To, so that way you can be righteous. You can have your sins atoned for and you can have that peace. But you must take hold um, of that blood of that blood. You must come under in order for you to be under this renewed 
covenant or this repair covenant because it's the same covenant, brothers and sisters. Only this time, Christ is the ratifier of that new covenant, his blood. So guess what? If you want to take hold of this new covenant, be under this renewed or repair covenant. Guess what? You got to accept Christ. You have to accept his blood if you want to come up under this new covenant. All right. Just like in Exodus in the days of Egypt, when uh, when God was going to pass over in the land of Egypt and he was going to destroy all the firstborn and stuff. He had Israel had him kill that lamb, put that blood on that doorpost. Let me just show you real quick. Let's go to Exodus chapter 12 and I'm going to read verse six and seven. Actually, I'm going to read verse five. It says your lamb shall be without blemish. And this lamb represents Christ, brothers and sisters. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And like I said, this lamb represented Christ and Christ was without blemish, physically and spiritually. He was whole. No defects, nothing wrong with him. Perfect physically and spiritually. Verse six says, and ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And that's exactly what happened to Christ. Israel had Jesus crucified. They spilled his blood. Okay. Verse seven. And it says, and they, meaning Israel, shall take of the blood and strike it upon and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. But. Um, the key point here is they had to take of this blood if they wanted to be covered whenever the Lord passed through. They had, they had to take hold of this blood and they had to strike it upon the two side posts and the upper door posts. See, all of that's cornal, but this uh, house here represents you. That house represents you and that blood represents the blood of Christ. And you got to have this on you. Because when the Lord come back here and you ain't and he don't see that blood on you. You finished. You're done. You ain't got nothing but the eternal flames waiting on you. And this is why Paul and the apostles and Jesus, this is why they were so urgent upon the people. To come under the blood. Because he understood. Listen. You don't come up under this repair. This renewed covenant. Which involves being up under the blood of Christ. You finish. You done. You going to get blotted out. Okay. But um. Yeah. Let's uh, go ahead and go back. And um, like I said, yeah, all of these things, they represented Christ. Let's go real quick to um, Ephesians chapter two, giving y'all a lesson before the lesson. But this actually all pertains to the lesson. I'm just kind of giving you guys a synopsis of what these offerings represent, brothers and sisters. It's very simple. So we're going to read Ephesians chapter five, and I'm going to read verse two. And it says. And walk in love, because love is the law, brothers and sisters. Walk in love, as Christ also have loved us, and have what given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. So we see that Christ, he gave himself as an offering to the Father for us. And ain't no greater love than that to give your own life. Ain't no greater love uh, than that. Now, I do want to say with these offerings, you know, they they had to all be done of, you know, free will. And that's what Christ did. He gave himself. Israel didn't. We, we didn't ask God to give himself. We didn't ask Jesus to give himself for us. No. He gave his self freely of his own will. He gave himself his life for us. I hope that makes sense to y'all. Okay. Now, 
Um, let's see if I want to read this last one. I'm trying to see if I want to read this last scripture. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and read it. John chapter 5 and 39. This is something that we must really truly understand. Okay, when we're reading this Bible, this is something we need to always keep in the back of our minds. Okay, especially when it comes to the first five book of Moses, this needs to be etched in our mind. And this is coming from the mouth of Jesus himself, God in the flesh. It says, he says, search the scriptures for in them, in those scriptures, you think you have life. In doing what? Things such as these offerings. Yeah, this right here, boy, this going to give me life. This going to make me right with God. No, it's not because these things are imperfect. In them, ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they. So those scriptures are they which what? Testify of me. And what some of those they's, these offerings. They testify of Christ. Because like I said, these offerings had to be done over and over again. And at some point it was supposed to click in Israel mind that, hey, we have to keep doing these offerings over and over again. This should let us know that these offerings are imperfect. We need a savior. We need something that can be the meat offering, the peace offering, the trespass offering, the burnt offering, etc., etc. We need something that can be that one time and forever that can cover us forever because these things have to be done continually, which means these things are imperfect. So that's what, in a nutshell, the Lord was trying to show our people through these offerings and many other things that he gave us. OK, but with that being said, guys, we're going to go ahead and we're going to get started. And we're just going to read this through. Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 1. And it says, And when any will offer, and, and when any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour. Okay, and this meat offering is also known as um, a grain offering. Okay. When it's talking about a meat offering, it ain't talking about actual meat. It's talking about grain, flour, different things like that. Okay, it says his offering shall be a fine flour and he shall pour oil upon it and put frankincense thereon. Verse two, and he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, and he shall take it and he shall take there out his handful of the flour thereof. And of the oil thereof, with all the frankincense thereof, and the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar. So that which, uh, so when a man brought a meat offering to the Lord, a memorial of it was to be taken and it was to be uh, burned on the altar. And the memorial of it basically mean a portion of it. It don't mean an actual memorial. No, it just mean a portion of that had to be taken and burnt to the Lord. All right. It says, and the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar to be what? An offering made by fire. Okay. So this one didn't involve no animal flesh. Okay. This is a grain offering. So we're going to be dealing with flour. We're going to be dealing with uh, bread with no leaven in it. That's what a grain, that's what this meat or this grain offering is. Okay. An offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And remember what I told y'all these offerings are about. Atonement and making peace. That's pretty much how I sum it up in a nutshell. Verse 3 says, And the remnant of the meat offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is a, it is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. So that which was left open because a portion of it was given to the Lord and the rest that was left over, it was given to Aaron 
and his sons, because remember, they were the inheritance of the Lord and not just Aaron and his sons, but also the Levites. So whatever was brought to the Lord, Aaron and his sons and the Levites, they also got a portion of what the Lord got. So this lets you know, them Levites, they was living good, boy. They was living good and they was not a broke tribe. I, I tell you that they was they were no broke tribe. They were arguably arguably probably were the richest tribe. Think about it. They got a portion of everything that was brought to the Lord, which mean they got the best of everything. Because remember, with these offerings and things that were brought up, remember, Israel had to bring the best, like the first fruits and all of that. They had to bring the best to the Lord. So the Levites, they was living good and they was eating good because whatever the Lord got, hey, they also got a portion of that. And um, speaking of that, there was actually a spiritual significance behind that because, you know, the Bible tells us that we would be joint heirs with Christ. So guess what? Whatever Christ got, we would get too. just how uh, Jesus, um, he was given all power in heaven and earth. He will rule over this earth, rule over the nations and all that. Guess what? We join heirs with him. So all of Israel, at least the remnant, all 12 tribes, those who make it okay, and rule with Christ. Guess what? We would, in a sense, we would be those Levites, the new Levites. Because that's essentially what uh, Levite, Lev, that's essentially what the Levites represented. They represented that remnant among Israel, pretty much. So even in that, there is a lot of spiritual understanding to be had. And that's the thing, brothers and sisters, this Bible is huge. There are so many things to be uncovered, so many understandings to be gained. But you can't gain those things if you're spinning a doctrine. Some doctrine that your pastor gave you 40 years ago, you're still spinning that same doctrine today totally ignorant of the mysteries of God and all of the wonderful parables that are here from Genesis through Malachi. Totally missing that because you're spinning a doctrine. Mm. But anyway, brothers and sisters, uh, back to it. I think I left off on uh, verse 11. I left off from verse three, so I'm going to read verse four, and it says, And if thou bring an oblation, which is just an offering, if thou bring an oblation of a meat offering baking in the oven, it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mingled with oil and unleavened wafers anointed with oil. Okay. And notice they had to be unleavened. Okay. Unleavened. Because remember, that leaven represents sin. So the Lord, he didn't want no leaven offered with this stuff. Verse five, it says, And if thy oblation be a meat offering, baking in a pan, it shall be a fine flour, unleavened, mingled with oil. All right. And of course, we know that oil represents the word of God. Verse six, thou shalt part it in pieces. And pour oil thereon. It is a meat offering. But notice it says meat offering. It's not talking about animals or flesh. Okay. Like I said, it's a grain offering. We're dealing with uh, flour. We're dealing with bread. Things of those natures. Things of, of, of that nature. Okay. Verse 7. And if thy oblation be a meat offering, bacon in the frying pan, it shall be made with fine flour with oil. And thou shalt bring the meat offering that is made of these things unto the Lord. And when it is presented unto the priest, he shall bring it unto the altar. And the priest shall take from the meat offering a memorial or a portion thereof and shall burn it upon the altar. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And that which is left of the meat offering shall be Aaron's and his sons or let you know Aaron and his sons and the Levites they got the best of everything because whatever the Lord got they got a portion of what he had and the Lord was brought the best like I said 
It is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. Verse 11. No meat offering which ye shall bring unto the Lord shall be made with what? Leaven. That's what I was telling you earlier. It had to be unleavened because that leaven represented sin. It says, for ye shall burn no leaven nor any honey in any offering of the Lord made by fire. Verse 12. As for the oblation or offering of the first fruits, ye shall offer them unto the Lord, but they shall not be burned on the altar for a sweet savor. So they gave the, but, so in Israel, whenever they brought the first fruits, that, though, that wouldn't be burned on the, off, on the uh, altar at all. Okay. They were to be brought as is. They weren't to be burnt on the offering or anything of that nature. Verse 13. And every oblation. Oh, and by the way, them first fruits, like I said, some of it went to the Lord and the rest of it and went to Aaron and his sons and them Levites. So like I said, the tribe of Levi, they ate good and they lived good. 13. And every oblation of thy meat offering, meaning every uh, offering of thy meat offering, thou shalt season with salt. Okay. Neither shall thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. And again, this salt represents the word of God and it represents the righteous works which that word of God produce. Okay. It says, um, Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. Okay. Verse 14 says, and if, and remember, I believe in the New Testament, it says if, uh, I'm trying to see if, do I want, no, I ain't even going to try to paraphrase it because I am a horrible Paraphrase. That's one thing I, I know that is not one of my strengths. That is <laughs> as paraphrasing. Because I want to read something concerning that uh, salt, because I told you that salt represented the word of God and the righteous works that was produced because, because of it. All right. Matthew chapter five, and I'm going to read verse 13. OK, it says. Ye, okay, talking to the saints, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? I mean, think about what we do, right? When we get salt, whether it's garlic salt, whatever, okay, we use it to do what? Flavor our food. We gotta get this food some flavor. But we put this garlic salt or whatever, we put it on our food. And then we eat the food and then we realize that the salt is bland. It's not giving any flavor. It's just bland. Guess what you're going to do? You're going to take the salt and you're going to throw it away. And then you're going to find some salt that's actually got some savor to it. Okay. That's why this is a great analogy. Said, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Okay. It is thenceforth good for nothing. And we are that salt, by the way, because the Lord says ye are the salt of the earth. And that savor is the word of God. OK. It says, but if it's lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing. That's right, because it ain't doing its job. It's not doing what it was meant to do. And that's to bring flavor to the food. It says, so it ain't good for nothing but to be cast out. And to be trodden under foot of what? Men. Okay. So I thought I'd mention that about the whole thing with salt. Because we see, of course, in Matthew, like I just read, we seen that that salt was brought up again. Verse 14. And it says, so we're back in Leviticus 2 and 14. It says, and if thou offer a meat offering of thy first fruits unto the Lord, thou shalt offer for the meat offering of thy first fruits, green ears of corn dried by fire, even corn beaten out of full ears. 15. And thou shalt put oil upon it and lay frankincense thereon. It is a meat offering. 16. 
and the priests shall burn the memorial or a portion of it, part of the beaten corn thereof and part of the oil thereof. With all the frankincense thereof, it is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Okay. Now, we have officially completed chapter two. And like I said, you know, a, a lot of this of what we're reading, these offerings, remember, I have to beat this into y'all head. These ha things had to be done over and over, year by year. So at some point, something should have clicked in your mind and say, hey, these things that we're doing, hey, they're imperfect. We need something to do what these offerings are meant to do. We need something to do this one time and forever. And like I said, that's what Christ came for. He came to be that offering one, uh, one time and forever, becoming that atonement and that peace between us and the Father, bringing forth righteousness in us. OK. Now. That being said, we're going to go ahead and read the final chapter, Leviticus chapter three and verse one. And it says, and if his oblation, meaning his offering, be a sacrifice of peace offering. If he offer it of the herd, whether it be a male or female. So this time, if it was um of the bulls and stuff, it could it could be a male or a female. So this is different from the burnt sacrifice. Burnt sacrifice had to be a male, but with this peace offering, okay, it, it could be a male or a female, and it had to what? Be without blemish before the Lord. So it had to be perfect from head to toe, no defects, right? It couldn't even be anything. I know we don't think about this either, but it couldn't even be anything wrong with the voice. All the other cows and stuff. Mm, but this one, <coughs> Lord, like, I don't want that. It's got to be a whole cow. Okay. Everything got to be right. Voice, skin, everything. Verse two says, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it at the door of of the tabernacle of the congregation and Aaron's sons, the priests shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. So again, this is another one of those offerings where this animal had to take, this animal was taking the place of the offerer. Okay. Verse three, and he shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the fat that is upon upon the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by the flanks, and the caul above the liver, with the kidneys, it shall he take away. Verse five, and Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar, upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is on the fire. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And if his offering and if his offering for a sacrifice of peace offering unto the Lord be of the flock, OK, meaning of the sheep or of the goat. That's what it meant by flock says male or female. He shall offer it without blemish. So, again, this is what is different from the burnt offering. See, with this peace offering, sacrifice of the peace offering. Um, the animals, it could be either male or female, but nevertheless, um, the male or female uh, cow or uh, goat or sheep, it still had to be without blemish. OK. Verse seven, it says, if he offer a lamb for his offering, then shall he offer it before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the offering and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation. Once again, this sheep or this goat, whether it's male or female, is going to be taking your place. All right. And Aaron's sons shall sprinkle the blood thereof round about upon the altar. Verse nine. And he shall offer the sacrifice of the peace offering an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Because remember, you sin against the Father. And when you sin against him, you have to die. 
That's the only way you can make peace with him. Is he wants your blood. But instead of taking your blood, he was willing to take something in your place. In this case, being that cow or that sheep or that goat. So basically through these offerings, you're pretty much pacifying the father, even Jesus through his sacrifice. Should we take hold of his blood? Guess what? Christ made that atonement for us in that peace between us and the father. So in other words, by taking hold of the blood of Christ, you have pacified the father in his anger against you. OK. All right. Where was I? Verse um, nine. And it says. Mm, verse eight, because I feel like I didn't read it. It says, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's son shall sprinkle the blood thereof round about upon the altar. Verse nine. And he shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering and offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat thereof and the the whole rump. It shall he take off. It shall he take off hard by the backbone and the fat that covereth the inwards and all the fat that is upon the inward inwards. Now, I find it um interesting. I just kind of thought about this um with these offerings that we had to actually kill, um, whether it's the burnt offerings or, or the sacrifice or the peace offering. I noticed the Lord, you know, we had to always put our hand upon his head. And it's almost like through that, we were transferring like our sin from us to this cow. And it's like, that's kind of what it signifies in a way like this cow or this sheep or goat. It's almost like through us touching and laying hands on it and killing it. It's almost like it was taking on our sins. If that makes sense. But that was just a thought that I had thought of just now. Uh, verse 10. And it says. And the two kidneys. And the fat that is upon them. Which is by the flanks. And the call above the liver. With the kidneys. It shall he take away. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar. It is the food of the offering. Made by fire. Unto the Lord. And if his offering be a goat. Then he shall offer it before the Lord and he shall lay his hand upon the head of it and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the sons of Aaron shall sprinkle the blood thereof upon the altar round about and he shall offer thereof his offering, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat that covered the inwards and all the fat that is upon the inwards and the kidneys and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall he take away and the priest shall burn them upon the altar. It is food of the offering made by fire for a sweet savor. OK, unto the Lord, meaning you've appeased them. All the fat is the Lord's last verse, 17 it shall be a perpetual statue for your generations throughout all your dwellings that you eat neither fat nor blood. And that is something that the most high don't play about eating that fat and that blood. Lord say, don't do it. OK, but that is the end, brothers and sisters, of those two chapters. I hope you got some understanding and I'll meet you guys again in chapter four. Shalom.